a few thoughts on just what makes a neighborhood. Um, and uh, some of us all probably have already all done this. It says, oh, what's the map look like? What's the spatial definition of our neighborhood? You know, is it six blocks or 10 blocks or 20 blocks or does it stop or start at this street or what's at the middle of it? Is it a school or a civic building or shopping center? But then neighborhoods have this sort of functional or cultural value, sort of the places you go to, to do the things you need to do, post office, library, school, you know, 7-Eleven, there's all kinds of strange places that can loom large in the psyche of a neighborhood. And then there's the culture of that neighborhood. And so I imagine that just like we were talking about the difference between, you know, sort of uh, Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz, you know, there's also parts of Santa Barbara and parts of Santa Cruz that have different characters. And here in LA, you know, being in Venice is quite different than Santa Monica. So, you know, when you asked me, Chris, in Santa Monica, I could have said like, same difference, it's a mile away, but I'm like, no, big difference. Like Venice is not Santa Monica in the, you know, culturally, certainly, probably functionally too. But, and then the idea of course, is to see how that culture can tap into these um, aspirations about promoting sustainability. People have thought about this in just kind of a, a drawing standpoint. So um, on the left is a classic planner diagram. Um, uh, his name is Clarence Perry who uh, came up with this idea of the neighborhood unit and tried to articulate what some of these fundamental features of a neighborhood should be in kind of a, a hypothetical diagrammatic way. And you can see in the middle, there's the community center, um, I think with sort of city hall, a couple of churches, um, these neighborhood institutions. Um, there's talks about 10% of the area allocated to recreation and park space, that there's sort of finer grain street networks in the center and sort of larger roads around the perimeter to allow for walkability. Urban planner, uh, architect based out of Chicago named Doug Farr um, updated this diagram about oh, 15 years ago um, in this book called Sustainable Urbanism. And you can see some of these more contemporary ideas um, getting folded in over at the bottom left, the habitat corridor so not just green space, but actually thinking of it as a corridor that you know, wildlife can move through. There's green infrastructure for stormwater management. I know DC has done a lot on stormwater management to address combined sewer overflow. Chris mentioned sort of sewage in the river. Um, I think more integration of open space, um, more thought about the different densities of housing and creating places that could be um, car free or low car ownership. Um, still really thinking there should be some central gathering place and you know a clustering of civic institutions that there's real value in these community centers, senior centers, city hall, library. Um, and uh, so this kind of gave us a, a sense of sort of how, what the elements might be that you would want to have in a sustainable neighborhood. And so, um, uh, you know, my colleagues and I just kind of came up with these list of qualities and attributes. So, you know, you do want, a sustainable neighborhood to be equitable. Um, that could be the quality of the schools, it could be the presence of affordable housing, access to fresh food, uh, not being exposed to toxins. So, you know, you get to food justice, environmental justice, um, uh, housing stability, um, access to education opportunity. Of course, you want it to be resource efficient in the buildings, but also the infrastructure. You want people to be connected to nature or the natural world. So this idea of biophilia, you know, is a quality you want in your neighborhood. DC is one of the biophilic cities that Tim Beatley um, has been promoting this idea. Tim Beatley out of University of Virginia has this sort of biophilic cities collaborative or something. Biophilic being love of, uh, philic love, bio, life, or nature. You want them to be adaptive to climate change, resilient, walkable, and bikeable. And then you can see over on the right side what some of these attributes are is you want transit, you want services like shopping, you know, medical services, schools, um, these types of things, employment, parks, um, schools, and then, you know, the building should be efficient. Ideally, they're green buildings, and so should the infrastructure. These are simple things, you know, LED street lights, LED traffic signals, you know, efficient pumps for moving sewage or for addressing stormwater. Um, it can sound elaborate, but I think a lot of it's fairly prosaic in just making the, like the right decision, you know, whenever a decision is to be made. 
probably someone else, not me, given who I am, but somebody else would probably have put down, you know, smart. We want smart cities. We want technology. We want remote sensing. We want to have adaptive systems, you know, um, thinking about data. All of that's important. It's just probably not where I go intuitively, but I can sense that it's the way that many things are moving. And I think done correctly, it can actually enable us to, to be more efficient in how we allocate resources like the public rights of way. You know, so a street might change its function over the course of a day, depending on the demand. So along comes this idea of a rating system that can address a lot of these factors. Um, the lead rating system for neighborhoods, lead for neighborhood development that's built around these three core principles that a sustainable neighborhood should be compact, which is sort of dense, but you know, also dense with open space. It should be complete, you know, housing, jobs, services, open space, um, and it should be connected. This issue of connectivity uh, looms large in the, the sort of the performance of a neighborhood that if there are um, safe places to walk, sidewalks, safe places to ride your bike, bike lanes or cycle tracks, and they, they are, and they get you from somewhere that you are to someplace that you wanna be, and you have choices in that network. So, you know, a grid is really valuable. Um, people will bike and walk. And if it's unsafe, or tedious or disconnected, um, people don't bike or walk, they get in the car. Um, and then even better, there's ways to connect the bike to the bus or you know, to Metro. So you get off of the Metro, you can get on a bike share, you know, lots of sort of first last mile connections, these types of ideas. So that again, you're not necessarily getting in the car, burning fossil fuels, accruing vehicle miles traveled right out of the gate. The EPA, in uh, probably 2011 through their Office of Sustainable Communities, which is where a lot of the national level smart growth thinking has um, kind of been generated, uh, put out a, an interesting RFP. So they said, we are looking for suggestions of how we could promote sustainable practices among local government using the deployment of established best practices. So we don't want you to come up with a new tool. We want you to look at what's out there and go to these places and apply it. And um, so it's kind of like a, somebody called it a reverse RFP. You know, here's a problem we'd like to solve. You tell us how to do it. You know, rather than we've identified the solution, we want you to go implement it. Um, and so uh, my, colleagues at Global Green and I said, well, there's this great rating system called Lead for Neighborhood Development. It was pretty much designed for de develop or created to design new places. And Lead ND's main spirit is we can make a better new community and sort of building on a lot of the work of the new urbanists and saying, you know, the suburbs are terrible for all these resource perspectives. We can make things more compact, more connected, more complete. And there were some examples around the country and you know, celebration is one of them and uh, in, in Florida and you know you can think it's weird and fake and creepy but it definitely has a lot of these qualities of density and housing diversity and walkability and civic spaces and and um, and so lead ND kind of folded in a lot of that thinking and then surrounded it with you know more sort of environmental um, and green building consciousness but it was still about new places so we said hey how about we take this thing that was sort of created to design new places and apply it to existing neighborhoods and really use it as an assessment tool rather than a design tool? And they said, that sounds great. Um, you know, congratulations. You've been, you know, one of four groups selected for this, you know, at that time it was gonna be a five-year process to go to a certain number of communities around the country. And we did. Um, it ran for four years and then I think, I forget what happened in Congress or That's something, but money disappeared, but we managed to get to a whole bunch of places as you can see over here on the, on the left. Um, and you can also just see the map. I think the orange ones when this map were made, yes, were where we had been and the blue, blue ones are where we were gonna go in 2015. Um, we created a RFP of our own, Cities Applied, um, we had a preference for disadvantaged communities. Um, we had a preference for places where something else was happening. 
stormwater investment because of a consent decree or public housing redevelopment, you know, through the Choice Neighborhoods Program, um, where there was a little bit of a, an engine already underway to affect change that we could build off of. And so here's the approach, specific neighborhood with a catalyst project. So they had to tell us where, they're like, it's this neighborhood and there's something going on that's a catalyst for change. So it couldn't just be the city of St. Louis said, come to St. Louis and help us out. People tried, they were like, oh, we know what you should do with your grant. We need this done. And we're like, no, we have a methodology. Do you wanna do this methodology? Um, and then the methodology is really a technical review before we get there being there for about three days, um, seeing what was going on, you know, walking around, trying to get to the location, you know, two or three times, different times of the day, um, engaging with the stakeholders, a whole series of these stakeholder meetings. Um, and, you know, we were there for two and a half, about three days. And at the end of it, the community uh, received this annotated lead for neighbor development assessment checklist. And then within like couple months, then we would do these final reports that laid out some themes on opportunities, challenges, and then recommendations for you know, how they could get started. And here's a little bit of what it looks like. I'm trying to see where we were on this one. This is downtown LA. We did one in downtown LA in kind of the arts district. Um, and uh, so there's our sort of checklist at work, the lead rating system, um, and uh, show you a few more pictures. Nice photographs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is the one, we'll see this one again, but this kind of shows the tool that we built around the lead categories. I'll, I'll walk you through those so you get a little better sense. This is just for neighborhood pattern and design. And you, know, you can see we had, is it already there? Is it just in the baseline? So, you know, some places would have a great street grid or great density or incredible mix of uses, um, good stormwater management. Um, are these prerequisites or credits in lead ND identified in any background documents as a priority? Is a regulatory support? So we made that distinction. So they may go, we really want to do lots of green infrastructure and stormwater retention. You go, cool. Like, is that in your code? Well, we try to get in our code, but it's voluntary. So we'd say, okay, is it regulated? Is it technically feasible? We went to many communities where they wanted to put bike lanes on streets that had no capacity to include a bike lane without dramatically constricting traffic or putting cyclists at grave danger. So we also had to say, sometimes you just don't have the space. Is there any evidence of market support? This could be for mixed use multifamily housing which a lot of people would like to see downtown, but in some places we'd look around and go, nobody's building it, there's no market support. Or we'd say, look, there's five of them. So there's totally market support. You could see this happen. And then what did we hear from the stakeholders? You know, are they saying that any of these ideas are anything that they want or that they would support? Because we're fully aware of our risk of the experts parachute in, we tell everybody what they should be doing. We go back to the airport, we write our report. You know, I did not want to be tone deaf. So this is why we would have these stakeholder meetings, which is a little different than some of the other um, techni similar technical assistance programs, um, how they were set up. I think everybody's sort of seeing the uh, necessity of stakeholder involvement these days. Um, so I'm just going to run you through what it looked like when we went to Seattle, when we were in the Chinatown International District. So, you know, the partners there were Global Green, we drove by the uh, U.S. Green Building Council, EPA, and then the city, the planning department is who invited us. And then this uh, SCIPTA is what they're called. They're a developer of affordable housing in this Chinatown International District. Um, and uh, the city selected this area because it's uh, sort of at the, the threshold of significant change. Um, and the city rezoned a lot of areas to allow for increased density to meet their housing needs. Um, and one of these areas is this um, Chinatown International District. And, um, and so there's a, a concern that there could be lots of new development that is not affordable. And, um, and the neighborhood could cease to perform the function that it has played historically is to be sort of a landing spot for recent immigrants to kind of get their feet under them before they move out to other parts of the city. So they didn't basically 
want to lose affordable housing or, or lose that quality of the neighborhood. They're also concerned about losing some of the sort of cultural aspects. It's been Japantown, it's been Chinatown, um, on the sort of east side of the five, um, you know, it's like Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, sort of more recent wave of, of sort of Asian uh, immigration is all in this particular part of town. And then a number of the stakeholders were just like, we don't want to lose that awesome Asian market. <laughs> so this was some very sort of personal level concerns. So here's what it, it looks like on the map. This, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the, the freeway that's cutting through diagonally is the five. Um, and on the, the left-hand side is the historic Chinatown district. As in one of the, the largest kind of remaining Chinatowns um, in the US. So, you know, there's a big one in San Francisco. Um, there's this one, the one in LA is still active and present. Um, some of the other Chinatowns that I'm aware of, at least in California, are almost non-existent. So, you know, Sacramento's is small, Portland's is small, Stockton's is, you know, a couple restaurants, you know, there was even one close to where I grew up in California, Central Valley, Hanford had a Chinatown because the train went through. Um, and, um, but that Chinatown is, is mostly just a memory and you just see it in the, the buildings, but there's none of the culture. So you can, Seattle, you know, it's really, it's seen as a real asset and there is this history of Japantown and Chinatown and um, not to go too deep in this, but these things come up like lots of trauma. So there was, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, in the turn of the century that, you know, made it very difficult for people to bring the rest of their family over from China. You know, there was internment, um, you know, of, you know, American citizens of Japanese heritage, you know, during the Second World War, um, you know, all through the country. And so a lot of people were moved out of Japantown to internment camps, lost their businesses, had their lives disrupted. You know, some people were able to come back, but there's a lot of this sort of history um, in the in the community that you know isn't so far beneath the surface and really does need to be acknowledged. You know, concurrent with coming in and talking about green buildings and LED streetlights and you know micro mobility. So here's the community. Takes a while to work with the city to figure out where to draw the boundary. Lead ND doesn't give you any guidance on the boundary. You know, it says, well, don't make it bigger than 640 acres. I think that's a square mile. It's big, you know, and it has to be at least one block and have, you know, I don't know, you have to have at least, I don't know, four buildings in one city block. So there's a, you know, it's pretty <laughs> expandable. Um, we came up with this size for the purpose of our study. Um, we looked at a bunch of existing plans, um, census, things from the planning department, um, things from other organizations that had been put together to just kind of get read into the community fairly quickly. Um, and then when we show up, we do a quick overview of what Lead ND covers. So I'll just share some of this with you. Lead ND has three categories, this smart location and linkage, which is basically build in the right place and don't screw up anything that's good that's already there. So, you know, build in a place that is already developed and already has infrastructure. Do not damage imperiled species or ecological communities. Don't build in the wetland or, you know, if there's wetlands, conserve it, conserve ag land. Don't build in the wetlands. Ideally invest in places um, uh, like qualified census tracts that, you know, really need the investment. Clean up brownfields. Um, be in a location where there's bicycle connections and transit have, you know, or there's storage and other infrastructure where there's jobs, don't build on steep slopes. And, you know, and if you can conserve or restore um, these ecological features do so. So that's all kind of background conditions. The next section is a lot of spatial attributes. The streets are designed to be walkable with sidewalks and appropriate width and trees and um, you know, entrances of buildings onto the street, a reasonable level of density to support walkability, neighborhood retail, transit, you can't have gated communities. These are just credits for some of the same things. A mix of uses from jobs to housing, to hair salons, to pharmacies, to schools, to doctor's offices, to churches, temples, synagogues. Um, not allocating too much to parking, making sure the street network is connected, there's decent transit facilities like a shelter with a light and a map. Um, 
access to public and civic spaces and parks and recreation facilities, that things are designed um, for people with mobility issues or sort of, uh, disabilities, that there's community involvement, uh, access to fresh food, um, tree-lined streets and neighborhood schools. So this is a lot of the um, physical attributes. And then the third section gets into green building about energy efficiency, water efficiency, in inside and in the landscaping, encouraging the reuse of existing buildings due to the embodied energy, reusing historic buildings, same reason plus the cultural value, managing stormwater, thinking about the urban heat island, increased temperatures, preparing for or install, installing solar. And then there's some sort of aspirational things in here, district heating and cooling, wastewater management, recycle content and in infrastructure. And then some simple things like, um, Infrastructure energy efficiency, the LED street lights, um, providing resources for recycling and making sure that you're not throwing a lot of glare around in the neighborhood. So it's all pretty basic stuff if you look at it, you know, build in the right place, design things so that they're kind of human scaled and support the right behavior. And then when you build buildings and infrastructure, do it in a way that's smart and resource efficient. So we do a quick introduction and then we walk around. So this is me and another guy in a checkered shirt um, who runs this kind of community um, advocacy group about development um, south of South Street in Philadelphia. And then um, the woman in the middle is Jessica Millman who used to work at EPA when they were first starting the um, Smart Growth Conferences and work on Smart Growth. She was on part of our team. And then here we are in Cary, North Carolina. Um, it's Aaron Welch with Ramey Associates and um, forgetting his name with US Green Building Council at their um, transit center, which is sort of at the terminus of this main street that they're trying to develop. Um, so there's a, you know, in the field aspect to all of this. Um, I showed you what our checklist looks like. So this is what the one for Chinatown um, uh, ended up looking like, you know, green means good, yellow means opportunity, and red means that um, there's real issues um, or opposition. Um, so one of the issues in Chinatown is there were a fair amount of industrial buildings um, and it was really breaking up the sidewalk and making it challenging for pedestrians in that area. So that was one of the things that, that came up for us. And we would turn it into these bar charts to kind of give a sense of how each category was doing. And then we'd summarize it like this and say, you know, of the total available points, 100, you know, how many are sort of achievable if you were to really go through the detail? We thought 33, you need 40 to be certified in lead ND. And we said, there's another 34 that are out there if you kind of put your mind to it, which would get them into the gold range. So this is a way to say, you know, it's a little bit of like, feeling how the wind is blowing, but to say you've got some good stuff and there's some things you could do to augment that. And these are just a few of the findings. Um, a lot of historic buildings, great cultural resources, a phenomenal nonprofit housing developer. It's very walkable. There's already affordable housing. Um, you can walk to a train station, you know, where like Amtrak stops as well as regional commuters. There's a lots of restaurants, fresh food. Um, so there's a lot of good assets here. Some of their challenges was that there is no up-to-date neighborhood plan. A lot of um, uh, old buildings that are at risk of earthquake. Um, we also found that a lot of the historic buildings were owned by um, like a hundred people. So, you know, when these buildings were built in the teens and twenties, there would be like, you know, many uh, sort of uh, individuals and families who would pool their money together to raise the money to build a building and own it collectively. So trying to figure out who to talk to about building retrofits is a real challenge. Um, concerns about displacement because of new development, the population under the five, there's definitely homeless. Um, there is a very fascinating situation where um, they're in like three police districts, two design review districts, three council districts and two school districts, which at some point you realize like could not have just happened by coincidence. So 
I mean, I'm speculating, but it seemed like intentionally or unintentionally, it was diluting their power because they had to go to so many different directions to have their voice heard. Um, and uh, so this was something that, you know, sort of an underlying systemic a aspect of the place that made it hard to have a cohesive plan and a cohesive voice. And then we arrive at some themes. You know, let's build new and preserve affordable housing. Let's keep the historic buildings. We need to you know, improve collaboration among the city departments. Um, and then there's some facilities and amenities that are missing. And then we kind of, in our stakeholder final presentation, we would ask these kind of questions. You know, if you're his owner, one of the owners of historic buildings, what do you need to upgrade it to seismic standards, you know, or upgrade the upper floors to habitability and egress standards so that they could be converted into housing or used as office space? Because there's definitely buildings where the downstairs active, the upstairs is not. Um, are there missing types of housing, small units for students, um, senior units? Um, you know, what other kind of uses would be welcome that are culturally appropriate? And you talked about this a lot, that most of the, you know, Chinese or Japanese character is um, conveyed through, the, through food. And we tried to sort of think of what else might be a, a valuable use, you know, from a a cultural, current cultural standpoint. Um, so it was a, a tricky question. You can see this was a, you know, a while ago, but there were already these encampments under the five. Um, this has become a much more common site, at least in Southern California. But what it would do is it would create a barrier for people to walk over to the other side of the freeway to go um, patronize those shops and stores over there. Um, you know, what's the best way to collaborate with the mayor, council, design review board? Um, I think because of being in multiple districts, it was making it um, challenging to figure out who to talk to. Um, this is a community garden that's next to a, a large senior housing development, a, a pretty, pretty famous one. And, uh, you know, we talked about making sure this was preserved, but thinking about what other types of amenities, um, you know, might, might be needed in the neighborhood and how to make those happen. And I just have a few more slides. So that's Seattle. This slide just shows some of our typical recommendations that came out of all those 29 communities. Um, you know, establish an energy efficiency or green building policy. So, you know, Chris and others, this is probably gonna happen at the city level, not at the neighborhood level. Creating pedestrian oriented design standards, that could be in a neighborhood plan. Having transit oriented development standards that could be citywide in the zoning ordinance. It could also be done, you know, customized. Um, understanding that a, a lot of bicycle master plans that we would run across were all about recreation. There was this sense that your bike is in the garage Monday through Friday and you take it out on Saturday and you want to go ride through some landscape. Um, so many bicycle master plans we saw, like the route just ended as soon as you got anywhere near the middle of town. You just throw yourself out on the street, I guess. Um, so we really had to think of, you know, bicycle planning as something for commuters. A lot of places don't let you do mixed use or live work. Um, you either have to do, you know, housing or commercial. Um, so these more flexible housing, living conditions, probably very much rising to the fore now that we're all living and working, whether we like it or not. Um, finding sites for affordable housing, finding sites for additional recreation space, and then kind of tuning the code on urban agriculture. Um, so it's, you know, it's not limited based on it being seen as a nuisance, but it's, you know, encouraged because it's seen as an, as an asset. And some of our findings from all of this work, um, uh, you know, Lead ND is really good at a lot of these physical aspects. It's not so good on process and it's a little thin on equity. So. Lead ND doesn't really tell you what to do in terms of stakeholder involvement, um, particularly to make sure that you've thought about historic trauma, historic disinvestment. Lead ND doesn't say, look up the redlining maps, <laughs> look up the instances of historic racism. Um, it's more like, let's design this right and look forward. And as we did more and more of this work, we found that this, you know, uh, trauma is present in many communities that we were engaged in. They felt neglected, um, you know, disinvested, ignored, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that needed to be acknowledged before we could really kind of go forward. Uh, 
having a little challenge here with my slides. I'm gonna go, I don't have to go through these blow by blow, but um, uh, these, um, there we go. Uh, and then similarly for equity, I think resilience and the fact that the climate is changing um, uh, sort of came in a little bit after the LEED-ND rating system was formalized. I think LEED-ND was formalized in 2009. So just in terms of the shifting emphasis on topics, by the time we're applying it in, you know, like whatever through 2015, um, you know, resilience became a, a much bigger deal. And we'd experienced Hurricane Sandy, I guess that had happened in 2005, but, um, or we had Katrina, but I think Hurricane Sandy definitely brought this issue home for a lot of people that, you know, resilience needs to be part of the sustainability conversation. And then we saw other things happening at this neighborhood level, like uh, Lead for Cities and Communities, which I'm involved in. I'm the chair of the working group, um, Eco Districts, um, which has had quite a bit of involvement in DC, is really sort of seeing the value of this sort of, again, neighborhood scale, district scale, um, sustainability as sort of, an, again, an, an effective size to be engaging. And just three places I can highlight, and then I wanna talk a tiny bit about collaboration and I will be done. Um, you know, people are always like, so what really happened? You went to all these places, did anything really take place? So in Cary, North Carolina, we, we did some follow-up and uh, went to Cary, North Carolina, and they're trying to make a, a have this sort of state highway that has some commercial uses on it. That they tried to make a main street, but it's kind of a, an icky street. And there's another street that sort of goes this way and terminates at an old school that's now a cultural center, some old houses, some vacant lots. And so they sort of said, this is where we think we could make some type of main street. Cary, North Carolina is primarily suburban, like cul-de-sac shopping center suburbia. So creating like a walkable downtown was like a big lift. Um, and they had ideas of where to put their library. And I said somewhere along there, I was like, well, you should put your library, you know, across from the cultural center and with a view of the park, not over there. Um, I call them up three years later and they're like, we moved the library. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had no idea that a little suggestion can be so powerful. They also told me that they had built the senior housing that we had talked about. There was some other thing that was going on. So I think we gave them kind of a boost for their thinking. Um, in Long Beach, New York, after Sandy, um, we had some of these early conversations about resilience hubs. And at this Martin Luther King Community Center, Global Green was able to raise some funding through National Grid and provide technical assistance to get them solar panels, energy upgrades, with the idea that there would be solar and batteries so that they would be able to be open for basic services if there's another extreme weather event. And then in Phoenix, uh, the Sustainable Neighborhood Assessment Team looked at an area, this Edison East Lake area, and I'm currently just about ready to send off the lead ND formal certification for their public housing redesign. So that was one of the places where it really made sense to pursue full lead ND certification and we're doing it. So pretty, pretty exciting to kind of see some of the follow through, you know, several years afterwards. So I think bringing sustainability into this conversation, it just reframes how we think about places, brings in new people, enables you to bring in kind of community development with equity, arts and culture. And it really highlights this need for collaboration. And this idea of collaborative governance, where you're really saying collectively defining what the problem is you're solving and then creating a process together, working on those solutions together and sort of delivering these actions with the idea that as you go through these steps, trust increases and the capacity for you know, a group, in this case, a community um, to achieve these solutions increases. And something I've found really exciting are these like um, internally generated neighborhood plans. So instead of waiting for the city to make a plan, they're like, we're gonna make our own plan. We're gonna say, this is what our plan is for, you know, and in the one that I know well is um, in East Los Angeles. They said, like, this is what we want. And if you're a developer and you wanna do that, good. If you're a developer who doesn't wanna do that, then you're in trouble. And so they kind of got ahead of local government and were you know, proactive in defining what they want versus always being in that position of, of saying no. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Like somehow we can be complacent and wait for the government to come up with it. So just a little bit about what it takes to be collaborative. I think I have two more slides. You know, you need to listen well, you need to give other people time to speak. Facilitation is an incredible skill in collaboration to make sure everybody's voice is out there. 
managing conflict, but understanding it will happen and, you know, constantly evaluating your process. And, you know, to manifest those skills, you also have to really be conscious of one's behavior, to be willing to be open, respectful, validate the works of others, have humility, and really try and create a, a spirit of mutuality or sort of shared collective action. Um, so much of our training is about like, I did this, I did that, this is my idea. Um, these are hard things to cultivate, but you know, they can definitely um, lead to different outcomes. And so I'm just gonna wrap up here that I think it does come down to, you know, to trust eventually and building trust among stakeholders. And that happens through shared experience over time. So we're gonna make that neighborhood plan, Chris, you know, we need to think about well, what can you do to start things off and demonstrate, you know, the a commitment and authenticity, you know, and sort of build on that and let that kind of grow over time. We should uh, see what it, what's gonna go on, right? Right. After COVID is. Yeah, so I think you want a shared vision, this, you know, give people agency and decision-making, not just talk to the community and say, thank you for your ideas. Now we're gonna go decide things, but empower them. Um, you know, share the risk on the outcomes and, and build trust. And I think that's the last slide. Yes, thank you. Wonderful, why don't you go ahead and cl uh, close your uh, screen there. And, uh, and this is, uh, we got 21 people. So it's man very manageable. This is the best number. It's the most successful number for conversations. So uh, why don't you go, oh, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna ask, um, looks like Jeffrey Neal, why don't you start off? It's almost five. You, you wrote a bunch of stuff in the chat, but why don't mm -hmm. you go ahead? We have a small enough group, go ahead. Hey, that, hey Walker, thanks say, for- Say who you are, too. Yeah, my, my name is Jeffrey Neal. The organization is Loop Closing, and we focus on the composting, on-site composting in particular, for, for regenerating our communities. And uh, again, thank you for rock, walking us through the process. And I really like seeing uh, this approach to bringing all these different thoughts and ideas together. Uh, I wanted to ask a question that was in the weeds and it may not apply. It may be too deep in the weeds and if, if that's uh -huh. the case, no problem. Um, uh, just let me know. But uh, what I'd written out was is um, how deep into the details does your assessment go regarding municipal solid waste? I saw that mm -hmm. as a category to, content, to consider in your infrastructure, but that's really broad. And that includes what's recyclable, includes your food waste, what's compostable, uh, those items. So in particular, do you track food waste recycling infrastructure? And if so, do you differentiate between on-site processing versus hauling away uh, the food resource? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we would do if we were to do this again um, is, you know, we, we asked this question about, um, you know, waste management, you know. So the first thing is like, is there recycling in this community? Because not everybody has that. And then we would say, you know, is there, is food waste part of what's being collected by the municipality? Um, and we'd ask where it goes and what happens with it. Um, you know, is there a biodigester? Is it composted? Um, is it curbside or how do people get it to you? And, um, you know, and if the answers were no, then we'd say those are things you should be thinking about and here's examples of it. Um, but we're not deep at, engage deeply enough to do that kind of tracking. So I think a lot of what we're up to is trying to unearth the existing conditions and then be able to, and this happened, you know, all the time once we had done, you know, five or 10 places, we'd be like, well, if you want to do food waste diversion, you really need to look at the program from this place because they kind of got it dialed in. Um, and so it was a lot of cross pollination, I guess, Jeffrey. Um, and then uh, you know, acknowledging that there's such a wide, this is what's so bizarre, is there's such a wide variety of application and it doesn't always fall out the way that you would think. You know, it's not like everything's perfect in Berkeley and Santa Monica and terrible in, you know, San Antonio or something. Um, uh, we would find these, you know, unbelievable sort of sources of innovation in some of the most curious places on housing policy or, or you know, somebody in the waste management department just decided they were going to like get a grant and do a biodigester through their state CPA thing and, and we're just going for it. So those are always inspiring examples. Biodigester. Yeah. 
Hey, thanks for that. And I would add this when you go through your checklist in the future, like you said, ask uh, how do you do handle waste? Do you recycle? Do you compost? Where do you take it? Also add the category, do you process it on site? So yeah, so talk about that a little more. Like how do you, is this like in LA, it gets collected and then it goes out to the, the desert. You know, it's like a, like a Not all of mile. It. Not all of it. Not LA all of Compost, it. LA Compost is an organization in LA in specific. You can look them up. Michael Martinez runs it and they compost on site. They have okay. systems throughout the LA name of place and neighborhood in LA. They've got a system up and going. And okay. they and so instead of hauling away, yeah. you composted in the in the community and actually at the source of generation, even at restaurants, grocery stores, they'll take it to that granularity. Um, the reasons for doing that is it gets it past um, a lot of structural inequities in our system or hauling it away somewhere. Well, it's not in affluent neighborhoods it gets hauled to. Those industrial waste facilities lead to more or less structural inequity. In addition to that, if the hauling away is stuck at 6% recycling rate in the U.S. because of barriers from cost mm. of land and equity or environmental compliance or restrictions, zoning, permitting, and then the killer of all neighborhood resistance. If you do it on site... <laughs> you can get past all these items, these mm -hmm. barriers, and you can get to 100%. Oh, and by the way, that money that was going to hauling, which is about 80% of $11 billion in the US, that money can then go to the on-site systems, but also local mm -hmm. jobs. And these are middle-class jobs. Like if you did it for DC's waste, um, you put this on each, each block or each commercial waste generator, you create 200 jobs where you could pay each person $80,000 in middle-class wages jobs to to implement these systems. So that's why I bring up the on-site side. Yeah. Um, and there's examples all over the US. New York City has a, a by rule, if you want to compost or, or process on site, you can just go do it. So that's a model hmm. example of, of how to do this. And, and I'm happy to, I don't want to monopolize. I've taken yeah, well. much time, but I'd love to follow up with you, Walker, if you want to um, yeah. on these specifics. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Okay. He'll never, I mean, Jeffrey never monopolizes, but he always has good stuff to say. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Hey, Steve Waltz, why don't you go ahead and, and share your question? Thanks, Chris. Um, and, in in so many of these neighborhoods, as we start to see these improvements, then gentrification moves in. Hmm. And so, you know, we think about having conscious approaches to be able to address how we can keep the existing people in the neighborhoods. Um, and as the housing prices go up, particularly the rental, the rental properties um, can drive a lot of people out. And if there's multi-generational families or, um, you know, just I'm thinking of my neighborhood, a, a lot of the uh, recent immigrant communities you know, are or they get driven out. Mm -hmm. and so have you built into your approaches conscious ways to address what do you do about the gentrification? Do you do, do you know, do you think about things like land trusts for the underlying land and keeping housing then in, in affordable or other things like that? Um, or is that more, again, is it more granular than what you're talking about? Uh, I think the granularity would be if we were trying to establish a land trust, but you know, suggesting it as a option, at, you know, in the right kind of condition is certainly part of what we would go through in those in the, the recommendations that would come out of the assessment. So yeah. again, trying to get to the baseline. So the first thing is, is there any you know permanently uh, income restricted affordable housing in this neighborhood? You know, so. You know, are there any low-income housing tax credit finance projects or public housing? Um, you know, some places there would be none. So nothing is protected. Everything is, you know, open, open market mm -hmm. at risk of displacement. In Seattle, you know, there's two community development corporations in that neighborhood. There's Skipta and then there's another thing called Interim uh, CDC. So there's okay. a pretty good... Uh, uh, cohort or population of affordable housing, but they, you know, were very concerned about um, displacement in that little Saigon area, the, the area to the east, you know, because it's it's an attractive location for new new development. So, you know, once you kind of get the baseline, then you say, all right, well, what's you know, what's here that could be preserved? Is there an acquisition fund? Has the city done anything on those regards? And then, what might we do to encourage more affordable housing development? 
maybe you need to create a community development corporation or bring somebody down here, or should we be looking at requiring a certain um, percentage of affordability in all new development? Um, and then again, Steve, this is when you start kind of, you know, in this format, because you're not able to stick around and totally solve the problems and dig in too deep, but you start throwing around best practices. He's like, here's a community benefits agreement from this place or an inclusion ordinance here or a way that, you know, people can get a density bonus for doing 10 or 15 or 20% affordability. But using lead and D and, and kind of going with what you've developed, there's not a particular, you know, point that you have to address. It just sounds like it's it, it becomes part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So this is another way. Kind of a formalized mm -hmm. part of the process. Yeah. So, um, you know, LEAD-ND uh, lead ND doesn't get into that level of granularity, but it talks about housing in, in this way. So it, it gives you points for having more diversity of housing types. Um, and so it encourages you to have, you know, single family townhouses, you know, garden apartments, high rise development. He uses this thing called the Simpson Diversity Index, which apparently can measure the diversity of anything, you know, rocks on a beach or fish in a pond or whatever. Um, so it encourages diversity, and then it gives you points for achieving certain thresholds for um, affordability, relatively low, 15 to 20 percent. Um, and then it gives you a bonus point for doing both. And um, uh, we work to kind of set the system up so it's very, very difficult to become a platinum community without earning the affordable housing points. So that's, um, that's one way that um, it's encouraged, but there's nothing that mandates that say there's provisions to have 15 to 20% of all housing units um, income restricted. Hey Steve, what, yeah. could you just um, uh, tell us which hat you're wearing today? Oh, um... I'm the director of environmental programs for the next six weeks at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And Chris, you don't know this, but I'm retiring then. Oh my um, gosh. And so I'll be doing just more volunteer work and other things around. So I'm thinking about, you know, as we think about environmental work and integrating kind of this environmental work with um, community development and transportation planning. And one of the things we're doing as an organization are, is trying to build our structures to allow that in more integrated metropolitan planning approach to be able to come to these problems and not just think of energy or environment in one and, and housing and community development in another, transportation in, in, in another. So we're also, as part of this process, going through a little bit of restructuring of some of our um, system, our internal work to be able to make this happen. So I'm wearing, I don't know what hat I'm wearing. That's, well, uh, okay. uh, That's uh, a wonderful, uh, congratulations. And, and hopefully this means you're gonna work even harder, but you certainly got a lot of work to do in the next six weeks. So to get all that done. Yeah, yeah well, we're just trying to get the systems put in place and you know, we just, uh, yesterday adopted a, a 2030 climate and energy action plan that tries to set direction for the region, including some of these linkages and things. Now the hard part will be working with localities to actually get things going and done, but um, at least it provides a framework. So, you know, we're doing a lot of those things for some of you know me and some of you may not, and um, or some of you may know COG and some may not. Um, so that's a little bit of background. Um, and um, I'm not yet setting what I'm gonna be doing next. So I'm not mixing and ma matching what I'm doing now with what I'll do after I leave to keep that a clean break. But I uh, hope you guys will see me around. Well, send that plan along. I'd love to see the, the, the version, the, the final version. Yeah, sure, Chris, we'll do. Um, let, me, one, let, me, let me just, oh. uh, just a tiny, you know, oh, yeah, sorry. one thing one notices as you go around the country is there are strong markets and weak markets. And if you're in a strong mm -hmm. market, you have leverage and you can say, okay, you want to build here? Then we want affordable housing. We want open space. We want new sidewalks. And, you know, you try and do this in, you know, portions of Cincinnati or St. Louis and um, you do not have that leverage. You know, so then you're yeah, and you know, you know, my neighborhood that is going through this justification issues and things is right next to the you know the Amazon National Landing part down in Alexandria, where Virginia Tech's building through campus and things, and so under incredible pressures. Yeah, um, and the hard part is to so, be it's to be out yeah. in front of it. So not through this work, but with some work with eco districts, I looked at what is it? Um, is it St. Elizabeth's Congress Heights? Is that what it's called? 
Yeah, that's up in, in the, down there in DC. Yeah, around yeah, the uh, Saint the 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 new um, well, right. The, yeah, the right. New, this um, new soccer, soccer facility, facility or whatever. Yeah, right. So yeah. this was a big question. Like, will this be? What will happen here? And there was all this discussion about you know community cultural center and new housing, and then this sort of idea swoops in and turns into this sports facility. But you know, I mean, you go to the intersection of MLK and Malcolm X, and gentrification is not the first thing on your mind. But maybe it should be because you know it's close to, it's close in. There's historic buildings. You know, it'd be hard to imagine. But one thing we learned about gentrification is, by the time you see it, it's almost already too late. Um, so yeah, you know, putting buying land and putting it in a land trust when land is cheap is essential because um, it goes up in value very quickly. So some of this work I think can lead to some of that proactive thinking and you know kind of get get ahead a, a little bit of the market. Yeah, just and so some of these areas we may be a little bit late for some, but, um, and then, you know, there's other communities as we see growth patterns around this whole Washington metro, metro area mm -hmm. that, you know, we need to think about what are we doing early enough, like you're saying. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to share real quickly, Nina Dodd, she had to go. Uh, many thanks for the great presentation. Sorry, I have to miss. I hope the district heating and cooling consider and cooling considered is the most, is not mostly re reliant on natural gas for the long term. <laughs> so, which is more. <laughs> this one is sort of a holy grail of the district people, and it's hard to see it pencil out. The infrastructure investment is so big, and uh, so I don't know. We'll see what happens. We're getting to these such a well, fish as a district. Pump that... no, go ahead. Hey, James. Yeah, I was going to say heat pumps using the sewage as yes. the heat um, source and sink is something that's being developed beginning to be developed around here. Um, and I know DC Water wants to monetize it and take get some revenue out of the heat or the cool in the sewage. Um, the American Geophysical Union building has put it in place as well as the DC Water headquarters that they built. But hmm. at a neighborhood scale, it's kind of an interesting technology that could start to do something with, with um, the thermal side of district heating and cooling. Um, and then, you know, you got to do batteries with other types of um, systems to be able to, to do it, to avoid natural gas. But um, the, the, the whole thermal side with the sewage is a really interesting one, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jim Shulman and then, and then Shalom. Oh, Shalom's raising his hand. So let's go with Jim and then Shalom will be afterwards. Go ahead, James. Um, uh, well, thank you, uh, Walker, for uh, uh, in-depth presentation and thank you Steve Waltz for your good question about gentrification. Um, my question is um, how does your tool um, apply to making decisions about developing this wonderful concept of the 15-minute city and um, it, it's uh, I know Paris is, is working on this and, and other cities in in Europe, but um, how do you decide, how can a neighborhood scan, it seems to me, help decide where the hubs of these 15 minute compact um, communities should be? Because it seems like there's every, every place in a city probably wants to be the hub. Uh -huh. um, that's an interesting question. Uh, in doing this kind of scan, you would, you know, you do two things like you'd spend some time looking at the map, probably looking around on um, Google Street View to try and get a feel for the land use pattern. Um, and then we, and this is why we go in the field and then you walk around and it's kind of a detective work. You know, it's a little bit of like the art of urban planning and having a feel for the sense of place, you know, to say, you know, what's, what's going on here? Like, why is there a cluster of activity in this place at this point in time? And then acknowledging that that hub could be um, something different, you know, like a lot of times it's the elementary school, you know, which many times of the day looks like nothing's going on. But if you go by, you know, 830 or three o'clock, it's going to be a, a beehive of activity. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, if there's a commercial strip or, or something like that, it's fairly easy to identify, you know, civic buildings you might think are going to be the center of the hub, but they may not actually have that much life in them, but libraries certainly will, will do the trick. 
So it's going to be a combination of those things. And then once you can kind of find it or find the potential ones, Jim, then that's when you look at that, that connectivity issue and say, well, you know, what keeps you from getting there in 15 minutes? And so one of the things we look at are like really long blocks. And this happens in a lot of places where there's sort of a former industrial area that may be, you know, in the process of being converted into housing. And you say, well, this long block needs like four streets so that, you know, there's a, an intersection every 250 or 300 feet. So you get a, a walkable street grid. Otherwise you got to do this huge end around, um, you know, remember this area in St. Louis where honestly it was like a quarter mile between intersections. Um, and these were the only two places that you could get across the railroad tracks or something. And the neighborhood was just completely, you know, completely shut off. So I think you find the uses where the destinations, and then you kind of look at the, the granularity they talk about it, or porosity of the street grid and figure out where you may actually need to propose a new street, you know, or pathway or, or bike lane to, to make the connection. We, um, you know, New York has often brought up like the, what is it, the, the distance between the, the streets is short and the avenues is long. Is that how it works as you go up Manhattan? Yeah, so you know, many people have been like, I walked from the Battery to you know Central Park because it was just stuff to look at the whole way. Um, you know, Portland is a loved walkable city. The blocks are like 225 or 250 feet long. You know, they're really small blocks, but it enables this this motion. So this is one of the things you would try and tease apart. You could also, in Cary, North Carolina, say you've got no center. <laughs> Uh, put the library in the right place so you get a critical mass. Because um, why would anybody go here? You know, and uh, so I, I think it's a combination of the the connectivity and the and the uses that. Again, it's kind of using all all your senses to kind of sense where the where these things should be. Well, this all sounds a little loopy, but you get a, you get a feel for a place relatively quickly. So Shalom, and then Annette Olson. Go ahead, Shalom. Who are you, Shalom? I, so I, I am a microgrid architect, and when people ask what's a microgrid, I usually say uh, neighborhood scale clean energy infrastructure. We've met before, Shalom. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they I remember right now. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe at an eco districts thing. I can't remember, but we've definitely met before. It up already. Uh, so I, I, I was actually very interested in, in hearing your presentation, which, which was lovely. And I see I, just from the demeanor, from your style, how it is that you're able to be in that listening mode in a community. Uh, even as you were talking, you were demonstrating that. So I appreciate Thank that. You. I, I thought I was coming tonight uh, because I also teach the sustainability class for Uwe Brandis's uh, urban planning program at Georgetown. Mm. I, and so I wanted to, to hear from that perspective. But building off of Steve's questions um, I, and your discussion about how the lead neighborhood standard is a little thin on equity, I, I, I actually think of equity in different terms. I, which is how do you help a community or a neighborhood build up equity? Mm. I, in part because I'm thinking about infrastructure investments, I, which have a return and which also deliver a set of values to a community. Mm. I, so the more direct ones are you know, economic savings and resiliency and emissions reductions, especially if we follow Nina's advice and don't rely too much on natural gas. Mm. I, and there are local resources like Steve was talking about with the sewer heat mining, which we just put in a proposal for that to the PSC for a neighborhood scale uh, energy district for that with the heat mm. pumps. I, Jeffrey, I'd love to talk to you sometime about uh, the use for the food waste as a resource, as an energy resource. Uh, so those things are out there. But uh, what I'm wondering about is, are you aware of any best practices that take some of the ideas of a community land trust and apply that to energy infrastructure investments so that the participants in, for example, a neighborhood scale heating and cooling district build up equity stakes in that infrastructure? Hmm trying to think of how to bring these things together. 
That's the power of shalom. Yes. Well, I mean, the, and like, here's a way to kind of dive into this is to say for many of these district systems, the question is who's going to own it and who's going to run it. And, um, and if there isn't a sort of a third party entity that says, you know, we'll, we'll own it and run it and sell you the resource, you know, then the other entity that could own it and maybe not run it, but that could own it would be the, um, effectively the homeowners association, you know, mm -hmm. or it could, which seems within the realm of reason that there's enough sort of fiscal heft to HOAs and legal structure capacity um, for that to happen and to say, yeah, I think this wouldn't be different at all from an HOA just installing, you know, 100 kW of solar. You're just buying a, you're getting a different machine that's a little more complicated to operate than solar panels. Mm -hmm. and, and then be, and then you could finance it and, you know, monetize the savings and say, we're going to do this at a district scale. It's going to cost less. Um, right. I, so that, I, that, that, that part I get the land trust I'm skeptical of mostly because it's hard to find the example in the country of the high capacity land trust. Their sacred cows are talked about all the time, but you know, I can't, I can't, not like I know everything, but I can't say, you know, here's the most kick-ass land trust that, you know, owns a thousand properties and has the capacity to move into energy systems. Maybe it exists, but I'm not aware of it. Right. I, I, and I'm thinking something more along the lines of uh, co-ops that have uh, mm -hmm. some of the same powers as a bid, mm -hmm. I, but at the neighborhood scale rather than a business district. Yeah. So out here, there's a thing called an enhanced infrastructure financing district, um, uh -huh. which there are infrastructure financing districts, but this enhanced one, you know, I think it, it I forget, I forget why it's enhanced, but I do know that it, there needs to be a sort of a, a specific neighborhood. I don't know if it has to be in disadvantaged communities. I'm not gonna quite remember, Shalom, but it has been brought up by the people who've done this. The, the economic firm that's done the greatest number of them out here is called Cosmot, Cosmot Associates. How do you spell um, it? K-O-S-M-O-N-T, maybe Cosmont Associates. They're, you know, real estate economists. They do municipal finance. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Larry Cosmont, you know, talked to me once. He goes, you know, Walker, these are sustainability finance districts. He's like, these are the things that could be done to finance, you know, stormwater infrastructure, district heating and cooling. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, and I think the, you know, similarly, like the property owners need to, need to opt in, but it's, it's um, I don't know, revealing itself to be a, a, a tool that kind of replaces redevelopment in California, but that can also enable some of these um, shared pieces of, of infrastructure. Um, so um, there's a thought, you know, I'm trying to think of the sequencing. The, the, the hard part with, not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but the hard part with so many of these shared systems is that um, you know, you need to get to scale and it may take a while to get there. So you're building a system that would benefit 500 houses because it needs to be that big to afford the third party operator, but you're not gonna build all 500 houses in year one, you're gonna build them over five years. And so, you know, how does somebody sort of weather the investment in the full system when it's not being used to capacity for a certain period of time? These are yeah. financing questions, I imagine, but this, these are often the, the problems that Emerge. Yeah, all right. Th that one I encounter all the time, and, and I have a, a, a toolbox for dealing with those issues. But the, the, thank you for the, uh, the the sustainability finance districts suggestion. Yeah. yeah, look up this thing: the E E I F D Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District okay. in Cosmot Associates. I okay. think it's um, you know it may be one of these sort of tip of the sphere innovations about how to how to get to some of these things that we keep trying to make happen and hit these similar barriers. All right, Chris, back to you. Yeah, we're almost um, out of time, but let me um, just, Rick, if you want to let you, since your, 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 your comment or question, yeah, I want to say it. something real quick, is kind of addendum to what we've just been talking about. And then just Jennifer and Annette maybe can speak to, they want to have a question or comments about urban farming um, and uh, community gardens as it relates to sustainability. And I think that, that sh we, that's all we have time for. Is that okay. sound good? Are you okay for the moment? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. So go ahead, Rick, and why don't you just add your, your 
million dollar ideas to the conversation. Well, thanks, uh, Chris, and uh, big thanks to the speakers uh, today. I learned a lot. I thought a lot of great information there. Uh, just in terms of the idea of, of sort of the community land trust idea and infrastructure, uh, I think something that approaches that uh, is, is land value return and recycling. So to the extent that investments in infrastructure enhance land value, today we allow whoever is lucky or shrewd enough to own the best served land to appropriate the lion's share of that value. And this transfer of wealth from the public to a few private landowners is the fuel for land speculation. And yeah. land speculation is a parasitic activity that creates no value, but which often uh, inflates land prices, in, uh, uh, exacerbates gentrification, has a lot of other negative consequences, also ends up encouraging sprawl by uh, artificially inflating land next to the prime infrastructure. So what some communities have done is they've reduced the tax on privately created building values while increasing the tax on publicly created land value. And what's interesting is that without any new spending or any loss of revenue, we can simultaneously through this tax shift make both the building and the land more affordable and create an incentive for development where land values are high, which tends to be next to our infrastructure like transit and road networks and all good schools and parks and all those types of things. So that's a way of sort of incorporating the land trust idea community-wide so that community created land values come back to the community rather than being siphoned off by uh, land speculators. Yeah, this is a, a topic of great interest. And I think that, you know, Lincoln Center for Land Use Policy it's out of Cambridge has spent a lot of time trying to articulate yeah, I, this. I put a link to an article uh, in the chat if anybody's interested. It's called uh, uh, Financing Infrastructure with Value Capture, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, if anybody wants, there's a link to that in the chat. I clicked on it already. So thank we, you, Rick. We were talking about this, Rick, many years ago, weren't we? Yeah. It's, an old, it's an old idea. It's an old idea. And there are communities in Pennsylvania that are doing it. Um, uh, a place that sort of does it on steroids, if you will, are places like Hong Kong and Singapore, where Hong Kong and Singapore, they own all the land in their jurisdiction. And then developers own the, the buildings, the skyscrapers that sit there, but they pay rent to the city for the right to locate there. And uh, one of the things that's interesting, particularly in the case of Hong Kong, is a lot of people assume that transit by definition requires subsidy. The transit authority in Hong Kong is one of the few, if not the only transit authorities in the world that runs at a profit. Of course, Hong Kong has very transit friendly land use. You know, it's very compact, very dense. But more importantly, uh, Hong Kong sold land to its transit authority before the tr rail transit was developed. And then the transit authority leases the land around and above its uh, transit stations to private developers who pay top dollar because they want their development to be at the transit station. So uh, Hong Kong is able in terms of transit to have low fares, but a very profitable system because they get money from the land value return. Yeah, well, thanks Rick. And I mean, we're getting into these um, a number of these sort of structural considerations that lead things to, you know, turn out the way that they do. And then I think we have to be careful about what we accept. So, you know, now we're like, well, the only way we're going to get enough housing for low income people is if we keep layering on subsidy and tax incentive and juicing the market. And we can forget to just say, well, let's look at this underlying tax structure. Like, like if I owned a piece of property that just happened to be next to a place where a new metro stop is going to go in and I don't do anything my property is going to go up a hundred times. And you then I walk a away. millionaire while you sleep. Right. And people and, think, people think this is just magic, yeah. but what you're doing is actually you're making money off of other people's work. 
Yeah, or off and public investments. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, let me talk about community garden a little bit. In the yeah, minute. Jennifer, if you, wrap up. Jennifer, yeah. if you want to set that up real quick and um, we'll have to try to make it fairly quick in your answer too. And then Annette, if you want to add to after that. And I think that's all we can do. So yeah. go ahead, Jennifer. I um, I I just was curious why you didn't include um, agriculture in your talk about sustainability, given that agriculture is one of the dirtiest industries. And mm. if you don't think about where your food is, like you're only as clean as your food. So if you know you can have the most sustainable community you want, but if it's still coming from a filthy big agro farm, you you really don't have a sustainable community because you're reliant on these big businesses to feed your population. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious why you didn't include agriculture as a larger, um, more central component. Like it, it's as essential as transit and schools. I would think what you eat, you know, it's it's like water. So yeah. I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So I mean, this probably will show up from more like a a food access standpoint of like access to fresh and healthy food rather than the land use of agriculture and, and saying, you know, if that can be provided by a community garden, great. If it's a farmer's market, great. If there's a store that actually provides that. Um, so to, to, to more think about the, the end goal of the, the food access as compared to the, the agriculture. And then Jennifer, it's, it's probably neglected a little bit in this presentation because in, in Lead for Neighborhood Development, um, the requirements they have for garden plots per capita are massive that nobody does it. So it's so ambitious, it's self-defeating. Um, and then they give you an option of signing everybody up for community so supported agriculture for a year. It's a good idea. you know. Or that there's a farmer's market um, like within a half a mile of your neighborhood, but then there's a whole bunch of rules like the food can only come from 150 miles and it has to all be certified organic and it has to operate nine months out of the year. So that credit when you're in lead ND brain is like, so difficult to achieve that we kind of skip over it. It's frustrating, it's ambition kills it. In practice, yes, it would be great for there to be a place to do, um, I grew up on a little farm, so I have a little standing here, like real farming at the neighborhood scale. So I think, you know, the community gardens are great. I think they're mostly about growing community, not so much about growing food. I mean, full scale. Farming. Full yeah. Farming in cities uh, like Detroit and St. Louis, I know are two big cities that are doing farming. Um, yes. I'm not, yes. I'm, I love community gardens. I support them, but I'm not talking about community gardens. Yeah. Um, right. Like I say, those are for a growing community, not for sort right. of feeding people. And so, um, yeah, I just think it's, it's an excellent point. And it's, it's sort of a, a land use that we think of as like, well, if it's left over under the power lines or next to the whatever, then we can have a nice community farm. But we don't think like there should be X amount of, you know, I've done a little bit of the thinking. I'm like, look, you got to have at least two and a half acres for it to be a farm. That's got to be the bare minimum. And ideally you got five to 10. And then you got to think about like where, where that is. Um, so I think I just need to tune up my slides a little bit and put agriculture into the community. I got the biophilia. I got connection to nature. I got to just say we got to grow food as well, as well as the food access. So point well taken. And, and that's a good person to end with because she has a lot of expertise uh, at the neighborhood scale. So Annette? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm not showing my picture because I look like hell right now, but uh, nice to meet you. And um, uh, so yes, I lead Green Neighbors DC, which is a neighborhood um, organization, um, which has risen in number and fallen and is a little low right now because of COVID, but we're all about neighbors helping neighbors. And as you noted, for the community gardens about building community because that's really, we can put in resources, but if people don't know each other, um, it's, you know, it's not a neighborhood. It's not, um, and in terms of climate change, people are gonna have to rely on each other a lot. Yeah. But you actually already answered my question regarding community gardens um, with the 2.5 acres. Um, uh, comment. I mean, what you said is spot on. Community garden plots cannot feed an entire household. It's um, the question of um, kind of also they're building community in the process um, and also sharing tools and resources so that people don't have to buy the tools um, that um, and thus save some money. But if you yeah. have any additional comments, that would be great. Well, you know, it's on this 
sort of climate change and resilience. So, you know, it's pretty clear that communities that fare better are better connected. They have more cohesion and then community gardens are definitely a way to build those bonds between community members. So, I mean, gives you a, a thing to do together, to get to know each other, to build trust. Um, and, uh, and so I think they're incredibly valuable that way. And it's a little hard to think of what else does this, yeah. you know, like kids sports leagues, church, temple, you know, synagogue, whatever does, mm -hmm. did, but that's waning, you know, as we become increasingly secularized, you know, there aren't the group of people that we kind of know and sort of hang out with, you know, on whatever day it is, you know, Friday evening or Sunday morning. Yeah. And, and a lot of like good community work gets done through, you know, those, you know, sort of places of worship. And I, I, I don't really know what's, what's replacing that, you know, but um, so I think this there's is some examples of just neighborhoods creating their own cultural events like mm -hmm. uh, mixers and parks every third Wednesday of the month or something like that. But it doesn't have the underlying strength and structure to really, you know, last long term necessarily it can right. easily phase out. So um, yeah, so that's one of the questions we're dealing with um, with Green Neighbors is just kind of the methods to help build the community resilience. And uh, um, yes, so anyway, thank you. Uh, dare I say that could be one of uh, President Biden's uh, emphasis of bring, how to bring the two sides or the many sides of this country together could be through these community garden programs. Yeah. So get that, that's maybe that's where we can develop this cohesion. Hey, I want to say mm -hmm. you can see why I was very honored and 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 very lucky to have been able to work with uh, Walker as a as a you know when he was uh, in as many roles at at Global Grain, including executive director for a while. Um, it's a, he's a real amazing resource, and I'm I'm glad I was able to reconnect them since we've left Global Grain. Um, thank you, Walker. I, yeah, I really thank you. appreciate. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I, I, the network wants to go somewhere with with this, and try to see if um, uh, what we could evolve that will work for DC, and um, and hopefully it looks like we have a lot of expertise here. There are a lot of others um, that Hi, Rick. Um, bring, like Rick's gotta go. bring into the uh, conversation. Also, want to just let everyone know on December third, we're going to be um, giving an award actually to another Global Green former employee named Annie White, who used to be the director of the Department of Public Works Office of Waste Diversion. And she's done some amazing work for Zero Waste. So um, I'm hoping you guys can consider joining us again on December 3rd at four o'clock uh, to, to honor um, Annie. It's gonna be very informal and, and um, it should- And Chris, if I could interrupt right here, I just, while you're doing, sure, thank sure, you. Sure, sure. I just wanted to thank you for hosting this and putting it together, especially under the uh, extenuating circumstances. Uh, our hearts go out to you and your yeah. family during this very painful time, even though it may have been expected. It's, it's always a blow when that happens. And uh, we wish you the best during this uh, painful tier period. I appreciate it. And thank you, Walker. Um, thank you. You have everyone have a great day and um, and we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.